got a decent microphone on here. Make sure I can record it. I'm very happy because it's the first time I'm able to present something about present ministry to your group, which is well known, obviously, in the Archdiocese. So thank you for inviting me to this important event. Um, I just wanted to say, my name is Father Baby Chen. I am a missionary of St. Francis de Sales. Originally from um, southern part of India, I came to Namibia in 1998. Um, my superior asked me if I would join uh, the ministry of the mission in Namibia. Um, as soon as I was ordained, probably about a uh, year and a half since I was ordained, and I actually. When I came to Namibia, I had no clue as to, uh, you know, where is Namibia and who are the people who are living in Namibia and what language they spoke. And coming from India, where there is about 1.3 billion people to a country where there is only 1.2 million people, it's a huge difference. In India, you go anywhere, you see people. But you go to Namibia, you look everywhere, there are no people. Because it's like scattered, so little people. So it was a cultural shock for me in the beginning, and the language and everything was strange and different. After three months, I almost said, It is Mukh, it Muda, it's too hard. So it was tough going in the beginning. Um, but somehow I perse uh, persevered in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mission. And then eventually I was transferred to Freedom Dog. Um, you know, you know, came as a Freedom Diocese. I worked there for about nearly two years, and then I was transferred to Cape Town. But from the Bibia to Cape Town, Prison was following me because when I came to the Bibia first, they asked if I would go and work in the prison uh, because the priest was working; they was not available anymore. So going into the prison very first time, not knowing the language and speaking to the strange people was a very, very, um, you know, um, a different experience. But that first visit gave me a deep impression and it just, you know, opened up another world to me. And then when I was in Freedom Dahl, it was the same, I was asked to do the ministry and then I continued, I came to Cape Town. Uh, Archbishop, late Archbishop Lawrence, since they asked me if I would do the ministry because Father Smith, uh, the Redemptorist priest, was moving out of Cape Town. So I then took up the ministry. Um, so from 2002 until today, I've been part of this uh, ministry. So I enjoy doing it um, and I'm happy. Um, Nina, who is interviewing me, is also one of the volunteers working with Restorative Justice. Father, tell us why do you think prison outreach is such an important mission within our church? I think uh, prison ministry is something that is that should be close to the heart of every Christian because Christ Himself mandates to us to visit those in the prison. In chapter 25 of Matthew, 
verse 35 we hear Jesus saying I was in prison you visited me so it is Christ who wants us to go and minister to those inside the prison my um, you know association with the prison age was starting off in Portsmouth the first going was very tough in the sense you you were going to a very not notorious prison you heard a whole lot about it but when you began to minister to them you began to see another world in the sense that you see human beings you see our own brothers and sisters who made mistakes but ended up in the prison now for me as a christian as a priest i found a sense of calling within my priesthood to reach out to the prison because i felt rewarded as a priest visiting because i felt that i was able to be at the side of someone who in many ways was rejected by the society and so many of them rejected even by their own families and so i felt this was an important ministry and i i and i and i felt that we as christians should actually reach out because they are our brothers and sisters anybody could end up in the prison anybody could end up in the prison so um, i think it is important that we as christians continue this ministry because that is close to the heart of jesus Father, currently you are the chaplain of Prison Care and Support Network. Can you tell us a little bit about this NGO, when it was formed, and what are its main objectives? Okay, Prison Care and Support Network, um, you know, um, it's been in, in existence for the last 22 years. So it's been long in the Archdiocese of Cape Town. Um, it's an NPO, um, started off actually in Toronto Bush in a small office and then it was in Athlon in the Columbus building and then it was here upstairs here and now, now it is in Pinelands, um, you know, in Morningside Street. Now, the, the main objective of the organization is to create hope in the individual because when you go into the prison, you lose hope, you lose sense of, you know, um, that that dignity as a human person and you lose everything that you had and so when that gate bangs against you you kind of you know remain hopeless and so to give that sense of hope is one of our ministry and, and that that is very important and we as volunteers would bring that hope to them by offering spiritual and emotional support because that is very important when one is inside the prison and, and we do this through various, um, you know, interventions. One, obviously, is the spiritual interventions. We do Holy Mass, confessions, and we do uh, prayer sessions, Bible studies, and then we do the restorative justice program. Earlier, we used to do Alpha, and many other small interventions that would help them to realize that they are children of God. Though they made a mistake, they still can rise and become a better person. So the intention, uh, the, the intervention is particularly to help them to realize their dignity and their, their identity. And then, then secondly, it is to also offer support. There are so many, uh, you know, prisoners, I always say, many prisoners, not all of them, many prisoners were victims before they became offenders. Victims of poverty, victims of deprivation from various sources. It could be that there was no father figure or no mother to give them that parental guidance to tell them i still remember young men coming to me and asking father if i had a father to tell me what is right from what is wrong i would not have ended up in this prison south africa has a serious problem of fatherlessness about 90 percentage of those inside our prisons don't never experience the love of the father that's a serious, serious issue. Now, you ask yourself, is a child born, is he born criminal? He's never born a criminal. How did he become a criminal? How did he develop a criminal, uh, that sense of criminality? Why do we have so much crime in Manenberg, Hanover Park, Elsie's River? Not so much elsewhere, elsewhere. So the whole question of context where a child is born, with whom he is associating, who are his parents, 
these are the whole lot that we can you know that we can discuss about and then um, you know we, we we also try to see those men and women who want to study we try to support them with bursaries or we offer them restorative justice programs or many other so our effort is to create in them the hope and give them an opportunity to be better people a question to you father is currently with the crime in south africa and the rate of recidivism obviously government has many ideas and proposals of how to reduce crime how to rehabilitate the offenders why do you think as a member of the church and representative of the church is spirituality so important in um, rehabilitation of the offenders? Yeah. I think all of us sitting here can say that I was a victim. I'm sure some of you had were direct victims or somebody else would be indirect victims. So speaking of, for the president is uh, not an easy task. A lot of times, a lot of people don't want to hear anything about prisoners because they say they have wronged the community, they go to suffer. But we don't ask ourselves, where did they go wrong? What was the first time they did wrong? How did they end doing what they did? So I think um, those inside the prison, I consider them as our brothers. Since I'm talking about in general. Obviously, there are some guys who will never get right. <laughs> Let's be real. But I'm talking about the general criminal crowd. They come from dysfunctional families. Many from poor families. And now when they are there, they're almost hitting the rock bottom. So they, we are going as volunteers to help them to realize that this is not the end of your journey. You need to make sense of this experience of being inside prison. So here spirituality is a very powerful tool to help them to find hope and to climb up, to rise from where they are. I have found so many men and women who grabbed the Bible and found a sense of direction for their life. So many over the last 20 years of my ministry, so many of them were able to find hope through Christian principle through the Bible through God's messages through prayer so spirituality is it, it's it's so important tool because it helps you to think change your thinking so the restructuring must begin here with the brain and with the rest of yourself and so it's important that we we, we provide that important component of spirituality to the ministry that we have. so to father I just want to share with them our last encounter we, we had an encounter with a gentleman that was serving 22 years and he said, thank you today, finally I feel like a human being. So it's recognizing there is this dignity within the person. Yeah. Father, you keep mentioning the program that you run, the Restorative Justice Program. That's, I think, is the flagship program of Prison Care Support Network. Can you tell us what that program is all about and what it offers and what it aims to do? Okay, one of, the, one of the programs that we do in the prison ministry in Cape Town is restorative justice. And um, Nina and Janine, the twins, are also involved in this program, particularly giving the leadership. Now, restorative justice defines crime as breaking of relationship. According to restorative justice, when a crime is committed, the relationships are broken. But the retributive or the criminal justice system would define crime as breaking of the law of the land. When a, when a crime is committed, we say the law is broken. And so punishment needs to be meted out to the person who did the crime. But on the other hand, restorative justice sees that when a crime is committed, relationship that existed, the harmony that existed is no more there because it's broken by what you have done. And so the focus of restorative justice is restoring the relationship, the relationships that are broken because of crime. How do we make sure that the main stakeholders, the victim, the offender and the community are brought together in order to, to, to bring about this restoration. In the criminal justice system, there is no way in which we are able 
to have a, a you know any sort of association between the victim and the offender because the lawyers keep them apart there's no way that the victim is able to share anything obviously i'm not talking about the the, the worst crime i'm talking about so many crimes that can be dealt with with restorative justice so to make sure that punishment for the for the sake of punishment is not the intention of prisons but it is about creating space for them to restore their relationship that are broken and so the focus on on, on criminal justice system is punishment because you inflicted pain on the society and now you go to go through the pain in the same level so the balance in order to, to you know bring back the balance um, and so the the, the 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 interest of restorative justice is that uh, when a crime is committed four levels of um, breakages are happened one is in the individual level when i do a crime i break a relationship with god i relation i break my relationship with myself i feel terribly upset so there is a breakage and then second level i break my relationship with my family i break my relationship with the victim i break my relationship with the community and so these needs to be restored and so our program particular restorative justice program present care is to help the individual to understand who they are who am i help them and then to take them to the journey where they are able to restore themselves you what you have done is wrong but that's the end of the end of the end of the journey you still have a journey ahead rise and walk and then help them to restore the relationship with the family because a lot of families want to talk about the crime when they come visit them but when we bring them together we take the families into the prison and ask them to talk to each other openly with truthfulness and then things come out and that brings a sense of restoration between they both begin to understand where they go wrong and so that helps them to restore the relationship they are able to write to the victim even do some community service so those are some of the you know kind of process thank you for that some pictures you have been about that dialogue between yes. the offender and the families at the bottom here for that we have many volunteers that spend their precious time waiting long at the prisons to get access for an hour on a Tuesday on a Thursday to sit opposite the incarcerated person to listen. Yeah. Simply to listen, not to offer a program. Why is that so important? Who would not want to be listened to? We all want to be listened to. But there are too few people to listen to our stories. That's a reality in the world today. and look at the situation inside our prisons they are just dumped into these places you have got 60 people sitting in a in a in a communal hall with one toilet most of the time the basins are broken there is no hot water there is so much of smell stinking smell inside this hall they they in 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 many ways you know you are actually put with people you have no clue of who they are what type of people you are you can't expect the other person who is in this cell to listen to you today he may be your friend tomorrow he may be your enemy so you don't know with whom you're living and so they are actually longing for some listening ears so when we as volunteers go into the prison we become that listening ear we begin to affirm the humanity of that individual whose humanity is denied by the system by the family by the society because they are not really human beings and so our presence is giving them that sense of humanity because you are worth i am prepared to spend the time and giving you that dignity as a person and so listening is critical in in affirming the 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 self esteem of people dignity of people and to a great extent you know in the prison we call them by number but we call them by name and that makes a huge difference so you just to confirm that every inmate has a story and you've recently um launched your book life through the bars 
what made you write this book after 20 years in prison ministry and when we do read the book, what you may see? Okay. I wanted to write the book for a long time. I don't know how many of you heard about the book. Did you hear about the book? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody who read the book? Will you let me yes or simply? So, yeah? did you read the book? Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to say, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. You know, please read. I know I'm happy that you bought, but I would also like you to read. Um, now, somebody, um, you know, two, a year and a half ago, or just a few, maybe two, close to two years ago, asked me, you know, you're going to leave the country now. Are you not going to put down your experiences and insights? I was shocked to that because I, I didn't know how to write a book. But then I said, after some time, I said to myself, maybe it's a good thing that I write. Maybe it's a good thing that I write. And I, I began to think about it and reflect and I said to this family, yes, I'm going to do this. And only one thing this family insisted, if you write, I only ask you to write from the heart, write with truthfulness. So I tried to do this. So my intention in writing the book was to tell the world that those inside the prisons, of those again, I'm talking, in general, are our own brothers and sisters. They made mistakes, but they have the potential to be better people. We as Christians have a responsibility and obligation to reach out to those. If I am able to change one, through him I am changing so many people. My experiences tell very powerfully to me that this can be done, but I need to create that space. So I speak about where do they come from, I speak about what happens inside the prison, I speak about the conditions, I speak about number gangs, you know about the 26 and the 27 and the 28, I speak about the number gangs, so you know the roots of number gangs and how do they, um, you know, operate inside our prisons as a parallel system, and then I speak about, um, you know, corrections, are they corrections, though we call, though we call prison now as correctional services, are they corrections? I speak, you know, very subtly about corruption within the prison. I speak about um, spirituality as well. Uh, I speak about restorative justice. I speak about what happens when you when you leave prison. There are so many people. You know, we have about seventy-five percentage of recidivism. People who go out of the prison come back because there is too little support for them to survive outside. And then I, I make number of recommendations to various stakeholders, including us as individual Christians, how we can get involved in, 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 you know, in creating a space where we try to help these men and women. Thank you, Father. Um, in closing, if anybody that has never ever been directly involved with this ministry, how do we get involved, firstly, and should they have the opportunity to go into prison for the first time? What would be the first experience? What would they see inside of the prison? Oh, for the volunteer. For the volunteer. I think the first volunteer, I mean, first time it will be shocking because, you know, you're in a different world, in a situation. But eventually when you begin to meet with the prisoners, you're going to see human beings and that's going to change your perception. And it will ease your fear and anxiety. And you sometimes get addicted. <laughs> I know about so many volunteers who are probably 75 still want to be in the prison. Yeah. And then volunteers, obviously, those who would like to be involved, they get involved through the um, office in finance, 23 Morningside Street. All our information is on website um, <laughs> www.pcsm.org. And then, obviously, you will also get all the information via the Archdiocese of Cape Town. Um, yeah. And then about the book, um, you, I'm happy so many of you bought. If you have not bought it, I brought some, and Jenny is uh, is uh, you know willing to sell it to you. It's not very expensive. It's only 170 rand. I'm doing marketing now, again. <laughs> but I'm just Autograph. saying, hey, Autograph. I can do it for you. No? <laughs> <laughs> With pleasure. 
So yeah, I would I would love that the book is uh, more than anything. It's about people reading it and also changing the way they think about criminals, correctional services, and also about what is going on around us. Thank you for making the way forward for you. Oh, for me. You should keep telling what is. Uh, I, I I said after 22 years, uh, um, I, my superiors have asked me to go, take a move, make a move. I'm going to do some part-time study and work in in Texas, in in, in the U.S. So that's my plan. Yeah. Thank you. So I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank Father Bevichen for for 20 years of his heart and soul into this ministry. Most of the volunteers can account for the fact. That they've encountered for the baby chin, and that is why they are hooked to prison ministry today. So he is a strong pillar in this archdiocese and a voice for those in prison. We thank you for that. Thank you. I didn't say anything about I didn't say anything about our needs, eh? but I know I know you would respond to the needs of the organization because literally who wants to support a ministry like this? Too few. So it's been a struggle over the years. So if you wish to take your one of the projects, I would be very happy, especially now that I'm going to leave the country, I would like to see the sustainability of this organization going forward. So I'm sure you will take you know, take that uh, appeal to your heart. Thank you very much. May God bless you all.